Hello once again, welcome to the program. I'm Charles Aite. Now, the National Cyber Security Center has received in excess of 8,000 cases of cybercrime between January and August this year alone. According to the center, these attacks have been targeted at mobile money transactions and electronic platforms of various commercial banks with high digital operations in the country. The National Cyber Security Advisor, Dr. Albert N. Chubosianko, spoke to Joy Business ahead of the launch of this year's Cyber Security Awareness Month, celebrated each and every October. The banking tra transactions were being done through digital platforms. In fact, I remember GIFs put up a data in terms of mobile money um, usage during the time. Right, so these are the background uh, development. Now from the cyber criminology perspective, uh, once you have a, num a, a lot more people connecting to the internet or uh, digital platforms, then that creates awareness for the criminal attacks. Uh, indeed, cyber crime is a crime of numbers. Um, if I'm able to develop a malicious program that is designed to intercept banking um, credentials, of course, that requires a huge you know, input in terms of the development. So I wouldn't just target one bank. Every existing bank will be a target. Every added customer on the e-banking platform will then therefore become a potential target. So it is, it is normal that we should see an increase with respect to cybercrime is that indeed there is data uh, backing the increase with respect to cybercrime reporting. Last year, the Minister for Communication on Abu Eslo's launched cybercrime cyber city incident reporting point of contact. And that has been very active from January to um, August this year. The center has received more than 8,000 cases. But we, record, we recorded the surge um, from March of this year when COVID-19 uh, got to us. You know, so these are the development and, and uh, we need to create awareness using the Cyber Awareness Man to ensure that uh, not only business but also individuals, of course, who are the customers of businesses are protected. Because once the individuals are protected, for example, in a banking environment, for example, if a banking customer is aware of the cyber risks, suddenly it, it reduces the investment that the banks will need to put in place also to protect their network. It's, it's a collective engagement, really. Once we have uh, a user exercising or practicing certain cyber hygienic practices, it, it favors the business in terms of how well they can uh, operate their digital platforms in a very secure manner. Mm. So with, with that, what the center is doing is the awareness month and all that. How is this year's uh, program going to be like? What should we expect? Thank you. I think COVID-19 has changed the way of doing things. And of course, the center's activities, uh, as far as cyber one is concerned, has also been impacted. Uh, for example, last year we had only physical engagement. This year we're doing a hybrid approach. Hybrid means we're having some sort of physical engagement, both in Accra and across the regions. But principally, we've also adopted a number of uh, virtual channels that will allow uh, many people to, to participate, uh, businesses, um, government, the public, uh, even children. You know, So we have four thematic areas. Uh, the first week of the event will focus on child online protection. That will focus on some safety practices for uh, for children. Then the second week will focus on awareness creation for the public. And uh, mobile money fraud is one of the thematic areas which we are engaging to to disseminate the message because we believe that once um, we intensify awareness creation uh, efforts on mobile money transactions and related fraud, we are likely to prevent the fraud by 75% because of the modus operandi that you know, uh, malicious actors in that space are using. So we, we really want to intensify that awareness creation effort. For businesses, it's good. Well, our concern is the protection of the critical information infrastructure, the banking platform, the energy infrastructure, the health infrastructure, the telecommunication infrastructure that actually is keeping us active once we have a lockdown. COVID-19, we need to review what potential impacts um, uh, 
on this critical systems uh, in relation to cyber crime and cyber security and, and you know take stock and as a government also engage with the private sector stakeholders to see how best we can scale up our effort in terms of protection in that space. Mm. What's the collaboration with the agencies, uh, i.e. the banks, the uh, government agencies with the awareness month? Yeah. Yes. I think essentially the National Cybersecurity Technical Working Group, which was uh, established by the Honorable Minister for Communication in 2017, uh, has become a mechanism by which cybersecurity is being discussed at the technical level. So we have the NITA, for example, NCA, BNI, CID, EOCO, FIC, NI, Data Protection, and others who are actively involved in the planning and an involvement of this particular event. So within government, absolutely there's that coordination around the Cyber Month event. But cyber security is not only a business for government. Uh, the private sector is key. So we've brought in a number of private sector players who are also involved in the planning and eventually the delivery of the various activities that are um, scheduled for the month of October. Is everything happening in Accra? No, I think that wouldn't be fair. <laughs> I think Accra has benefited from our work, uh, of course, the capital. But for the past two years, uh, we realized that we need to reach out to our brothers and sisters, you know, our citizens outside Accra. So, um, you know, this year is very unique because we've deployed virtual platforms. So you may be somewhere in Bulga or Kumase or Sunyani, and you can still join in uh, to, to follow proceedings and even ask questions and make you know, submissions. So that is um, a dimension that we are looking at reaching out with, with the masses across the country. But apart from that, we've also teamed up with certain stakeholder groups across the regions, all the system regions. So we'll be going through the regions and the partnership that we have with those institutions, we can then also uh, touch base and, and send awareness uh, and a capacity building um, programs to, to people in the various parts of the country. So uh, it's really a busy month for us. Mm -hmm. for the cyber security in the era of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, of course, <laughs> there can't be a better uh, team that has been selected by the planning committee. And we just need to create awareness. Um, there has been a biological virus, you know, COVID-19 is a biological virus that has really brought the world to a halt in months. That has also killed a number of people. And now the fear from the cyber security community is we may also wake up one day and our whole critical information infrastructure has also been compromised by a computer virus. This is possible. It has happened indeed before in which um, power grids have been shut down by ransomware, by malicious programs. Now it's a question of the skill and I think it won't take long before we get there and, and that is one thing businesses need to, to look at it in terms of protection. But of course government is always an enabler and that's why the government is leading in terms of policy strategy development. Uh, that is why the Ministry of Communication is introducing uh, cyber security legislation to, to cover any existing you know, loopholes with respect to our laws. And that is why we also create an awareness. But really, it's a collective business among all the community members, businesses, the public individuals, working closely with government, I think we can... Well, and you did hear the National Cyber Security Advisor and she, Boy Siako, in that discussion there with my colleague Ebenezer Sabotim. It's all part of, you know, plans ahead of the, you know, Cyber Security Awareness Month, which kickstarts from October, which is just a few hours away, tomorrow exactly. We shall be giving an update on how to stay safe online, especially when fraudsters are gravitating towards the cyberspace in these recent times. But away from that, the country will be receiving about 92.9 million euros from the European Union for its economic recovery from the impact of COVID-19. The cash, which is expected to hit the country's treasury account soon, will help support its fiscal program, which has been challenged because of the rising expenditure. Now, part of the fund is also aimed at supporting the security agencies of the country for the December elections. 
ambassador of the EU delegation to Ghana, Diana Akonsha, in a short ceremony to sign the agreement, praised the country for its strategies in handling the virus so far. She promised that the EU will disburse more funds to support the budget programs of the government. This is, ladies and gentlemen, how the emergency EU budget support in response to the COVID-19 crisis in Ghana came into being. Assembled to mitigate the devastating effect of the COVID-19 crisis in Ghana, this budget support contract between the government of Ghana and the European Union consists of a total amount of 87 million euro, nearly 600 million CDs, to help Ghana face the multiple impacts of the crisis and support a robust recovery that I see from the recent statistics has already started. And at this point, Honorable Minister, let me here commend your government and Ghanaians for their exemplary response on so many fronts in such challenging times. I am confident that Ghana will rise from this crisis stronger and proud, and I'm proud that the EU is here to contribute. Honorable Minister, in spite of the difficulties and suffering of the past months, today is a happy day. Our teams have worked hard to make this happen, with more than one moment of frustration because we would have liked this to come faster. But at least we made it, and again, I'm, I'm very happy that we were here to sign this. In a few days, the European Union will transfer the bulk of this sum as a direct, untargeted budget support to the National Treasury, Treasury of Ghana. And let me assure you that this is an unprecedented operation to respond to unprecedented circumstances. Now, internally generated funds at the Confort Nutrition Hospital have seen a drop due to COVID-19. The chief executive of the hospital, Ohene Ousui Danso Fingers, figures that the hospital's low patient attendance as a result of which is, according to him, the major factor. He was speaking at the 2020 Media Performance Review. Consequently, I wish to submit that there were complete downward trends in all the clinical activities and the related indicators of the narratives and units for the health first half of the year when compared to the same period for 2019. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, surgical operations, surgical operations fell from 9,818 in 2019 to a performance of 7,310 surgeries for the first half of this year, indicating a decrease of 25%. Laboratory services recorded for the period in 2019 was 159,494 cases, while that of 2020 was 136,450 cases, which can place to a decrease of 14.45%. Where the local services recorded in the first half of the year was 25,488 cases as against 27,157 performed in 2019, resulting in a decrease of 6.15%. The Family Medicine Directory, OPD, Care Attendance, which recorded 37,120 in the first half of 2019, fell to 22,208 in the same period this year, which translates into a 40 percent drop. Physiotherapy services also fell from 9,455 in 2019 to 4,521 in 2020, which is a decrease of 52.18 percent. Radiotherapy services also registered a 51.30 percent decline in the first half of 2020 with 2,004 cases as against 2019, which recorded 4,115 cases for the same period. Blood screen by the transfusion medicine unit for the first half of 2019 was 9,615, as against 7,811 pints for the same period in 2020, which is a drop of 
thousand of eighteen point seven six percent. Total deliveries for the period under review also fell from three thousand two hundred and one in twenty twenty as against three thousand five hundred and sixty three in twenty nineteen, and this is a decrease of ten point one six percent. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the declining figures stated here notwithstanding. It is important to know that the world will continue to make some significant strides in the year 2020 in our equipment, good tooling, and infrastructure upgrading efforts, which are worth mentioning. It will report that the current board of management at Zoom office at the time when the hospital was faced with severe equipment breakdowns and shortages due to years of underinvestment, thus undermining the ability of the hospital to provide optimal care to its you're still watching the marketplace. Now, the chief executive of Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahin Edu, has justified his projection of 900,000 metric tons of cocoa by the end of the 2020-2021 crop season. Speaking to Joy Business at the site of the signing of a $1.3 billion syndication loan, Joseph Boahin Edu explains that interventions made to increase crop yield puts Cocoa Board in the best position to even exceed the 900,000 metric tons cocoa target. Listen to him. When you are going for any facility, you must look at your crop outlook. It's very, very important. Some time back, we made a mistake. Look, in 2015, 2016, uh, Ghana went in for um, a two billion facility. And they, there was a projection of a uh, uh, making 900,000 metric tons. Now that year, Ghana could not. We made a production of less than 800,000. Uh, 2014, 15, we made 740,000 metric tons. The following year, it was 778,000 metric tons. Now when you produce that, meanwhile, you've, you've sold your cocoa forward. You've signed contracts with a view that we are going to uh, give your buyers 900,000 metric tons of cocoa, then you end up making 778 or 740,000. It means you've defaulted. You've taken the money. So they compel you to produce the cocoa. And that's a, one of the problems we came to face. You know, we are defaulted. <laughs> and at some point, we have to go and pay uh, a penalty at the international arbitration. $7 million for default. And then we also had to pay all the defaulted cocoa contracts. You see, so when you are going for syndication, you don't just go and then take the money, no. You have to sit down and then look at your crop outlook to see if your crop outlook can meet the amount you are requesting. That's why we go in for 1.3, you know, noting that we've been producing around 800,000 metric tons. So if you sell 60% of that, you should be able to pay. Now, the Ministry of Fisheries and Agriculture has launched this year's edition of the Farmers' Day celebration slated for November 6 this year. According to the Sector Minister Elizabeth Afolukwe, part of the focus this year will be about leveraging the policy for collaborative management to eliminate challenges faced in the fishery sector. This year's celebration is themed agribusiness development and our COVID-19 opportunities and challenges. Nicholas Brown has more. Speaking at the launch, Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture Elizabeth Avoliqui says Ghana's agricultural sector is gradually shifting from primary production to adding value to its produce. The theme highlights the new orientation for all actors along the agricultural value chain. Ghana's agriculture is now transforming from subsistence and primary production to one of value addition and agribusiness. To declare the 36th edition of National Farmers Day, slated for the 6th of November 2020 at Techiman in the Bono East region, 
duly launched. Madam Afolukwe also bemoaned the challenges that has bedeviled the fisheries industry, indicating that measures have been put in place to deal with the issues. The fall in the production of fish in Ghana um, is largely due to a lot of or a myriad of uh, issues. Uh, the major issues are illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing activities practiced by fishermen, both the industrial fishermen and the artisanal fishermen. Um, but gradually we are taking you know, practical steps to uh, try to engage more with them. Uh, enforcement of the law has taken place um, several times. Um, people have been prosecuted. Reporting for Joy Business, Nicholas Brown. Now, the Railway Minister Joe Gatti has revealed that the viability of the Bwankra inland port that will commence in November will rely heavily on the railway systems. He, says this, uh, he said this at the salt carting ceremony of the 83.5 kilometer railway line from Kumase to Obuasi by President Takufuado. It's going to be the first phase of the uh, railway project and it's going to connect Kumase to Kase. Um, it is a six kilometer railway line and that is what the president is cutting sword for the commencement here at Kasi, which is the start point. Um, it is, it, is a, it is a project by the Ghana Railway Authority and the Ministry of Railway Development and all the dignitaries are here to help. It is basically meant to ease transportation from Kumase Kasi through to Obwase when finally completed. It's also meant to um, enhance um, trade and commerce between and through these particular communities, uh, connecting a number of communities in this um, region and the neighboring regions. Um, it is, according to um, a lot of people and according to um, officials, it is very critical to the economy of the a country because a railway is one of the cheapest, one of the fastest, which means that transit of uh, transport of goods and persons from one point to the other in the region very soon is going to be easy and uh, livelihoods will be affected and uh, most definitely um, the economy is going to grow and local businesses are going to, be, are going to thrive as a result. Well, the country is faced with about 12% youth unemployment with more than 50% underemployment. That's a disclosure from a New World Bank report. Now, this is both higher than the overall unemployment rates in Sub-Saharan Africa, despite major investment by both government and the private sector. The report said this challenge will intensify if job opportunities remain limited. To tackle youth unemployment, the report highlights the importance of having disaggregated data on youth job seekers by location, gender, skills and capabilities to inform policy and funding decisions. There was also the need to respond to appropriate and tailored employment programs, the report indicated. Well, that's how we end this edition of The Marketplace. I'm Charles Aite. Do stay on because Election Brief is up next.